Okay, now, welcome to Free Speech Zone. This is a uh, real quickie here because I'm actually going to a picnic today, but uh, these are the last two parts of the Thomas Drake interview, and uh, uh, plus we're filling in with uh, that uh, Lionel piece about the, the myth of the two-party system, the myth of the left-right paradigm. So we'll just show all these three in a row without interruption, and see you next week. Thanks. Welcome back to Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay, and we're continuing our series of interviews with Thomas Drake, former senior executive of the National Security Agency, who blew the whistle on the NSA's inability or unwillingness or deliberateness to not deal with intelligence or act on intelligence they had that might have prevented 9-11. He blew the whistle on a billion-dollar boondoggle of it creating an intelligence uh, surveillance apparatus that, uh, on the whole, seems to be completely worthless, and blew the whistle on the whole mass surveillance program itself. Thanks for joining us again. Thanks for having me. So, so where we left off, we're talking about the instruction to the NSA gives to its people, and I, I, one, I guess one assumes this begins with Cheney, get it all, meaning the Constitution's not really an issue right now because we've been attacked. Let's get every piece of data on everyone we possibly can. Um, is that kind of describing? No, and uh, the program's name at, at NSA was called Stellar Wind. It was actually a secret. It's now been made available. You'll go out to the website. You'll websites have it now. But um, President Bush, October 4th of 2001, actually signed a secret presidential finding order. Uh, authorizing the, what was called the President Surveillance Program. It was known as the program uh, by those who knew about it or read into it. Now, I've always thought, rightly or wrongly, or speculated, that a lot of this went on pre-9-11 anyway. Out of the Cold War, they already had their justification. Out of the national security state, they were spying on people in all kinds of ways. Uh, did 9-11 just give them the, the means to justify a, an enormous new expenditure to kind of do what they were doing, but just on a much bigger scale. Much faster scale, basically carte blanche, licensing unto themselves in secret the means to just expand this far beyond any constraints that had existed. It didn't matter what the law said, it didn't matter what the statute said. We're going to just treat the United States as if it were a foreign nation for dragnet surveillance. And they started with phone numbers. They started with the big telcos. They had secret agreements that already were in place, particularly with AT&T. A lot of those were expanded greatly. Uh, as we know from the Snowden disclosures, we know at least Verizon uh, for many, many years and continues to do so to this day. I was turning over all phone numbers via the FBI to NSA every day. Um, so it started with phone numbers, and then it went to uh, emails. Uh, email addresses, you know, internet service providers, uh, internet usage, uh, internet data, data mining, as well as financial records. Now, the claim all along was we're only looking at metadata. Yeah, that's actually, uh, that's a government meme uh, because they're desperate to protect the fact that wherever possible because of the advances in technology, they want the content as well. Metadata in some ways is a misnomer. It's really meta content. You can, get, you can know, get to know an awful lot about a person by virtue of just the metadata, as I call the meta content. Oh, break that down. What does that mean? For metadata is really, it's, if it's like a phone number, it's just the phone number itself, the duration of the call, your phone number, the numbers that you're calling, location information, subscri basically subscriber information, your account information, similar to what you get in a billing statement. That would be, that would be the metadata. But they were doing more than that. Increasingly, as time went on, the advances of technology have allowed vast amounts of the content to be kept as well. Because otherwise, what's the point? What do you get out of having just metadata? That's part of the mindset. Do you want to collect it all? You, want to, you, you don't want to just stop at collecting metadata because the technology allows you to collect the content along with it as well. In fact, the metadata really is the context for the content. Now, in, in various TV shows and movies, we, we've seen NSA guys with their headphones on just willy-nilly listening to all kinds of conversations. I used is, to do that for years overseas, you know, listening in on communications of other countries. So that's what started happening here. Right, but you don't have enough people. You don't have enough pairs of ears, so you increasingly go to technology. 
But this is without warrants. This, the, the listening that is going on is happening without warrants. Well, there are cases where they still do the warrant process. You know, they do more of the traditional warrant process. But we were talking about the wholesale violation of thousands upon thousands, tens of thousands of, of people living in the United States. And uh, and, and this, uh, and get at everything, are they recording actual calls in wherever, data banks? Where, wherever possible where the technology afforded it. See, digital, ironically enough, the digital, um, the digital uh, revolution, the digital age, we've had an information age for quite some time. Go back to Marconi, or go back to the telegraph, right? That's radio Marconi. Go all the way back to the 1840s, when the, the tele telegraph was, was invented. You know, see the people with the Morris Code, it, you know, as we call them, the military, the Diddy boppers, right? Just, you know, dots and dashes, right? Um, we've, we've had information. Um, the information age for quite some time, right? Sort of along with the industrial uh, revolution. We're talking about the digital age. It makes it much easier to store it, much easier to keep it, because it's not analog, it's digital. It's all ones and zeros. It can be stored. But I've always imagined, and I've, you know, that, that in theory they can, they record like this massive amounts of actually recording people's conversations. Increasingly. And then they can do keyword search, and if they want to pull up a particular person's call, they can. Is that what they've they done? Can. They can, yes, increasingly so. Or do machine machine conversion, where they actually are converting it into text and then doing uh, very rapid uh, scans in terms of keyword searching. So this is quite contrary to what we've been told, if I understand it correctly, because it, it keeps, I keep, as far as I understand it, they keep saying it's just metadata. Yeah, when well, they that, we get a warrant. Without getting into the weeds of the legality, they've argued what's called third party doctrine. It's based on Smith versus Maryland uh, from the late 70s, this argument that you have no reasonable expectation of privacy when it comes to metadata. That's basically their, their argument, which they, it was a secret interpretation of the original Patriot Act, which was signed into law in October 2001. Essentially, meant I could just show up at any business, right, and I could get the business records. And, it, and the fact that you have an account with them, the fact that you're a subscriber, uh, doesn't matter. You have no reasonable expectation of privacy. For now, security purposes, we can ask for it. And increasingly, they're using that mechanism to gather as much of that subscriber data as possible. But they go Under further. the guise of national security. They go much further than that. And they've been going much further than that for many, many years. Which means recording actual calls without warrants. Yeah, or getting entire billing statements and, and not just the metadata, but now being able to take the, the actual calls themselves. Who you call. Fold the content of text messages, the content of emails. And what do they do with this massive amount of data? Store I, it and search through it. Or just keep it, keep it in case they need it later. Or for parallel construction. This is one of the other things that's a, that is now being used routinely, where under the guise of national security or the guise, uh, the guise of intelligence, you're actually collecting it and then you're repurposing it. So you're actually using it for law enforcement. You're using it to go after people. You're, you go, you're using it to create crimes. Where the FBI can charge someone based on the NSA information, but then they But it's already tainted. You've, missed, it's, you've, you've tainted it, but it doesn't matter because now you're hiding it behind national security. Yeah, and, and you, the FBI creates its own scenario how they supposedly got to this yes. information without the NSA. When in fact, what, what, what they're hiding, what they're obscuring is where it actually came from or where the trigger, what the trigger information was. Now we know... They're completely bypassing due process, which protects you know, persons under the Constitution. Now, when you're hired in, in 2001 and you start working at, at the NSA, one of your jobs, if I understand it correctly, was you had to actually decide what would be the software that was going to do all this. And, and there were two different paths to go down. Is that right? Well, one path is mass surveillance or collect it all, just take it all in the digital age. Uh, the other path is you get much smarter about it. You only, you only take what you need. You only, you only target. I was taught to target. This goes back to the Cold War. Even in the Cold War with the advanced technology, we didn't take it all. We used to joke about we were like one of the vacuum cleaners of the sky, but even though we were a vacuum cleaner, we only, took, we only sucked a little bit of it. Take it all was called Trailblazer. The take it, well, take it all actually was the mass surveillance regime. Trailblazer was supposed to be NSA's answer to the 21st century because they realized they were coming up increasingly short and making sense of large volumes of data. So they needed something that was completely different, right? But they used their mindset 
right, from the old analog days, the traditional ways, and just said, well, let's just build something that will take it all. The Trailblazer itself was an utter failure. They never did deliver. They spent a whole lot of money. I was about to say that a lot of that is not actually driven by the amount of money you can spend, the amount of contracts you're giving out, and back to something we said in the earlier segment, how banal so much of this is, is because yeah. it's about making dough. But a critical, and what, what enabled that was a critical strategic decision that, that General Michael Hayden at the time made as the director of NSA. He said, we're going we're to buy the solution, not going to make it. Buying it meant we're going to go to the military industrial intelligence complex and we're going to spend lots and lots of money for them to provide us a solution. If you're the military industrial complex, you're not going to provide a solution that you're going to deliver within just a few, a few months or a couple of years. You're going to milk it for all it's worth because that's the nature of the military industrial complex. How much did it wind up costing? Well, the original program was almost $4 billion. They spent several billions above that. By the time all was said and done, over a six-year period. And it didn't work? Didn't work. They never actually delivered anything. All they did was spend a whole lot of money and create a whole bunch of PowerPoint slides. It became the seed money in the, in the year after the last year of the Trailblazer program when General Keith Alexander in 2005, August of 2005, becomes the new director of NSA. They use the remaining money as a Trailblazer to start up his answer to Trailblazer, which was the collect it all approach, literally, called turbulence. And so what are they using now? It's the follow on to turbulence. Turbulence. And a whole bunch of other programs. Any idea what that would have cost? Billions and billions. I don't even know what the full, full cost is. It was already several billion when I left in terms of turbulence. And this is, you know, this, you know, this big data requires big programs and big money. And, and is there any billion. evidence turbulence has a made the country any safer? No, other than collecting a whole lot of data. I mean, they've, they've got a, this massive facility they're building out in Utah, the Utah Data Facility. They're also building an even larger facility uh, at the main campus at Fort Meade, Maryland, on what used to be the golf course <laughs> that I used to run around. <laughs> I know William Binney, who was involved in de developing, uh, who was at the NSA, who retired just around the time you started working there, right? Had developed something called Thin Thread. And what, what Thin Thread was an extraordinary program. It was, it was actually to answer the key challenge problem. They called it, they had challenge problems. The key, one of the key challenge problems is how do you make sense of data, right, when there's vast amounts of it. So what they called it was the volume, variety, and velocity. So you have tons and tons of it, all kinds of it, and it's coming at you faster and faster each and every day. This is the explosion of the digital age. Fiber optics, massive bandwidths, huge, super high speed. How do you make sense of it? Uh, far more than, than it, we'd ever had the analog. In some cases, it makes the era that I grew up in, although I saw that transition in the early 80s from the analog to the digital age in terms of regular tape recorders and you know, headsets to actual computer-based. So I, was, I, was, I lived that transition in the early 80s when I was overseas flying on RC-135s and doing electronic warfare. So in the 90s, they realized post-Cold War with internet exploding, and of course, internet had been developed, ironically enough, to deal with a nuclear winter in case you blew out all your communication nodes, you could still get the message through. So here's the 90s, what do we do about all this data? And a very small, uh, it's called the SARC, it was the, it was the, the this SIGINT, Signals Intelligence um, uh, Analysis Research Center. So a automation, the SIGINT Automation Research Center, otherwise known as a SARC. SARC was like a skunk works operation. And Bill Benny was, was the crypto mathematician as well. And I got to know them. Um, I actually got to know them before 9-11. I got to know them after 9-11 uh, when I was there as a senior executive because they actually had the answer. They had developed, developed this over several years. It was ready for operational deployment well before 9-11. It was never given the green light. It was actually formally canceled in August of 2001. I attempted to resurrect it shortly after 9-11. Um, I, it was again a burden that I carry. I had a two-page uh, classified implementation plan and it was all rejected. And just if I understand it correctly, what it did is you would have someone you had some reason to believe was involved in no good and then you could build 
patterns of interconnections, so you're actually targeting something based on some actual evidence rather than just get it all. And then Vinny's argument now is get it all means it's you actually just made a haystack bigger within which you're trying to find a needle. Yeah, a completely different approach. One is you build big, bigger haystacks. The other one is you actually look for needles. So how much <laughs> so how much do you think this is just driven by getting to spend billions and billions of dollars? Uh, I could I can make a very powerful argument that it was that was the prime one of the primary drivers. Massive national security jobs program. And we're gonna and, and I know senior executives and program managers who spoke to this quite openly. You know, we're gonna we're gonna get make make us just super rich from 9-11 and from all these programs. Even before 9-11, it was already going in that direction with very large programs. So you can imagine Hayden making a strategic decision to go to the military um, industrial intelligence complex and simply buy the solution. That meant you're gonna have to spend lots and lots of money. These companies are not gonna belly up to the, to the billions of dollars they're available, uh, we used to joke about it, the Trailblazer bar for nothing. And, and from a strategic point of view, is it in their consciousness how concerned are they about domestic dissent? How are they concerned about if there's ever 20, 25, 30 percent unemployment, if you actually get into a place where you start to have a real mass movement in this country? Is this in their mind that this might help us in those days? No, it's just national security state. You know, we, we've, got, we've got priority and it's an existential threat. So we'll spend many, many billions to deal with the threat. But you don't think it's also at some point they think could be used domestically to control? If you're talking mass surveillance. That's what I'm talking. Um, again, this is another one of those elephants in the room. Mass surveillance is not about protecting people. It's about social control in the end. That's you what don't I'm bring all this information and don't store it all. This is like, you know, this is like um, the minority report, right? You have this vast amount of data, you're going to use it against people. And part of what you're going to target, and this is, you know, from within, is any potential threats that exist. Similar, just on a much larger scale, on a much more automated scale, that happened during the Nixon administration. Nixon had enemies, and he used the FBI and other instruments of national power, including NSA. NSA had a program called Operation Minaret. It was literally to take the power of NSA back in the 60s and early 70s to target those who were designated as threats to the state, in total violation of the Constitution. Um, I've been suggesting that what happened in Baltimore during after the death or murder of Freddie Gray and all the resistance that rose up here, um, that this seemed to also be, let's take advantage, never not take advantage of a good crisis. The National Guard comes in, they get to learn how to occupy a fairly big American city. They have a curfew, they get to learn how to implement a curfew in a fairly big American city. I mean, it seems such overkill that you got to wonder why spend so many millions of dollars on this unless it's kind of a dress rehearsal. And then I wonder, we know there's such a thing as fusion centers, which is where the various intelligence agencies, I think even military intelligence is involved, local police force, FBI, like everybody's supposed to be collaborating there. I mean, to what extent do you think this listening ability, or I mean, get it all ability, can be driven out of a fusion center, could be focused on a place That's like, an a, like a Baltimore. It's a it's a it's a day-to-day -day end state. You never can get enough data. You're addicted to the data. It's like you're 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 a drug addict and you're mainlining every day and there's always more data to feed you. And there's there's many, many veins you can stick the needles in. But do you think when you have something like the Baltimore resistance, or some people call it uprising, going on, I mean, are these fusion centers listening to all these people, everybody's phone calls? Increasingly, yes. That's how you maintain social control. That's how you keep track of people. You don't want uncertainty. You don't want, you want control. I, I keep coming back to that. The whole point is control. You can't have people just, you know, acting on their own because you might not be able to control it. Now you're back to authority, you're back to, you're back to structures of power to keep people in their place. It doesn't matter whether or not authority abused their power, as we know happened. But there's long-standing issues in terms of, of, terms of the social structures. And they created it, it and right? And the social structure. And this is so egregious. That someone actually murdered in a van, right? Murdered. Murdered. 
and the social structure that has to be defended is the one that has chronic poverty at its heart. Yes. Tragically so. Why do you want to really fix that? Why would you want to actually empower people? Why do you want to let them have the opportunity to self-actualize? You've got to keep that in place. So it makes it very difficult to get out of that. So yeah, you look the wrong way, act a different, you just, you're, on, you're on the wrong side of the street, hey, we're just, we're just pick you up. People actually were, here I am, a white man. My, my private attorney, when they actually indicted me, I didn't know they'd indicted me. He, I'm at lunch down in Bethesda, just minding my own business, although I was waiting for this. I'd already been secretly charged. It was just a matter of time in which they would actually drop that sword of Damocles on me and actually indict me. And I knew it was going to be quite public just by virtue of what was about to happen. I didn't know exactly when. We knew it was imminent. And he calls me, and he's, he's on the phone with someone at desk says, where are you? I said, what do you mean, where am I? He says, yeah, where are you? He actually thought I'd been taken right out of the store. I'd just been and incarcerated. And then he was going to have to come and actually either post bail, if that was possible, or actually visit me in jail. Okay, we're going to continue. Please join us for the next segment of our interview with Thomas Drake on Reality Asserts Itself on The Real News Network. Welcome back to Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. We're continuing our series of interviews with Thomas Drake. He joins us again in the studio. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So one more time, fast. Thomas is a former senior executive of the U.S. National Security Agency, and he's a whistleblower. And, uh, well, you've got to watch the other parts. This... So I'm kind of, uh, I don't know if I'm surprised, amazed, or whatever, but it, it seems important. How well this national security state, how well this system can adapt to whistleblowers. Like, Bradley Manning showed us video of helicopters <laughs> slaughtering people down in the street, including, you know, in a van, a kid, and this and that. War crimes. It's a war crime. And it's a story for a few days. and. The Snowden revelations, the fact that a million people get killed in the Iraq war. I mean, maybe the most important one of them all, that the fact that the whole Iraq war is illegal and, and based on a total fabrication. Complete, utter move, fabrication. Utter. Move on. Everything Powell said was a lie in front of the, the world the United Nations. And they knew it. In fact, I, my own little speculation here is that the reason they wanted the UN inspectors to go in was to make sure that there was no weapons of mass destruction. Because if there actually was, you wouldn't have invaded. That's right. And you really, if Powell was telling the truth that there's Scud missiles all around Baghdad with camp biological weapons pointed at Israel, you're actually going to invade under those conditions? You actually want to make sure that there's nothing there, then you go in. But anyway. My point is, is what do you make of the fact that then the Snowden revelations, uh, here's actually, here's a little clip of uh, Michael Hayden Somebody would come up to me and say, look, Hayden, here's the thing. This Snowden thing is going to be a nightmare for you guys for about two years. And when you get all done with it, what you're going to be required to do is that little 215 program about American tele telephony metadata. And by the way, you can still have access to it, but you've got to go to the court and get access to it from the companies rather than keep it yourself. I go, and this is it after two years? Cool. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, it's an NSA-approved act. That's just to tell you everything. They have no problems with the USA Freedom Act. So before we get into the detail of that, but what do you make of there's been such revelations, such exposures, and they can kind of just shrug it off and it, keep going. Well, it reminds me of Catch-22 in the Joseph Heller novel. We have the power. Who's going to stop us? Even when they're exposed. Because they're the ones that have the power. And that kind of power, as Frederick Douglass said back in the 19th century, does not yield willingly. And what do you make of the role of the media in all this? Because I don't, this isn't possible without such an important enabling role of mainstream TV news. 
mainstream is mostly complicit. It's to their advantage to maintain the status quo. And which means they've sold out to power, they've sold out to access. They've, off, they've become stenographers for the government, mouthpieces for the government, you know, parroting government talking points. I guess the, also they, they rightly have judged, and not just the media, but the people who, you know, who have such power. Um, and that's not just people in political positions, but people that have lots of money that can pick, pick up the phone and get people in political positions whenever they please and finance their election campaigns and all that. Um, they have judged, and, and, and correctly to a large extent, that for most people, day-to-day -day life is so, such a struggle that a lot of these other issues we're talking about just are abstractions. They just don't seem to affect your life. Much of it is. I mean, for most people, they're not affected by all this. The wars that you're talking about take place elsewhere. They're someone else's problem. Better there than here. And hey, you know, the government's supposed to keep us safe, so, well, if they're keeping us safe, then I don't have any reason to question them. And I hear this all the time. I have nothing to hide, so what am I worried about? I don't care if they're listening in on my conversations, if, even, even if I'm not doing anything wrong. And what's your answer to that? Well, I actually do a privacy exercise with people, and everybody to date has been thousands of people, and no one has said yes when I run this exercise, which is turn over all your keys and all your passwords and all your accounts and all your health records and everything else and put them in a lockbox, and I'm going to keep them safe for you. And everybody, with the exception of one person said maybe, and he was being cute, have said no. And then we have a real conversation on why. Because if you're not willing to do that with me as a consenting adult, as a fellow citizen, then why would you be willing to let the government do it in secret? That somehow the government is more trustworthy than me? That's where we have a real conversation about what matters. It does come back to we the people. Some would say there's a fatal flaw in any form of democracy. It's the people. So part of it, power recognizes that most people don't have the, they don't have the cycles to deal with this. They don't have the time to deal with it. And yet we have a fundamental responsibility as, as a civic responsibility as citizens to remain informed and keep informed. That means there is an obligation on the part of, of the press to inform the public. Well, what if the press is not informing the public? What if they're not actually providing everything the public needs to know in the public interest? Now that means whistleblowers, in essence, are, they're, the, they're the, the canaries in this constitutional coal mine or the coal mines of democracy because we're the ones that are, are giving the warnings. And I think part of what the media does, and, and, and it happens throughout the culture, uh, there's a disconnect, as if this national security state is somehow just about protecting American foreign interests abroad or against threats, and even if it oversteps. But it, it's, not, it's not seen as that it's directly connected with why wages are so low. No. Why people live in poverty, why there's high crime rates, why schools are so bad. I mean, it's, it's the, the state's in defense of a whole legal sub superstructure that's all about you have a, a shadow. few people getting rich. Well, it largely is. And that, that's, I've said this, I keep saying this, I've been saying this for years. The shadow government obviously is its own enterprise and it rewards those who pay obeisance quite richly. You can make a tremendous amount of money and have a lot of access as long as you remain silent and just do your job. And if you're a large corporation, because you now have this extraordinary alliance between government and corporations, then guess what? You're, you know, that alliance is, you know, you can't, there's not much daylight between those two. So that's why I like the USA Freedom Act, for example. Yeah, if you're a Hayden or NSA, hey, who cares whether we hold the data or whether a Verizon holds the data? We can argue about the particulars, but we still have access to it. So what's the difference? Plus, they get immunity, so no one can ever file a class action suit against, against them because they got a national security exception. So, yeah, it's, but what are we talking about? I mean, I keep coming back to, yeah, how much money are we spending on national security? And what are we getting in return? The argument was made that mass surveillance was necessary. Okay, because it stopped terrorist incident. I mean, this is the great grand justification. And yet when pressed to the test, even Alexander first said 54, when it came right down to it, maybe one, and that was probably stopped by traditional law enforcement. That was a taxi cab driver in San Diego wiring $8,500 to El Shabaab in Somalia. So all of that, all of that, and, and, and essentially turning the Fourth Amendment inside out under national security justifications, all that money was spent, and then what about all the overseas adventures? 
If you add all that up, we're talking multiple trillions of dollars from 2001 until 2015. What could we have spent that money on? Was well, all that money, what are we trading off is what I would argue. Are we actually saying that providing for national security, not the common defense, but just national security, now takes priority and precedent over everything else, including one of the key obligations of the government is to provide for the common defense under the preamble of the Constitution. That's what we're sacrificing. That's what we're, that's what we're losing. And it's kind of ironic because if you actually push some of these hawks that in, in politics that support this policy, one of their main defense is how much jobs this all creates. But it's kind of a real joke because the same people are against any government employment program that might build schools or a green economy and all of this, but that's precisely what all this military spending is as a but that's government. that's a privilege, it's, a, it's a, effectively a privileged gated community. That's what it is. The vast majority of Americans don't get to enjoy that. So what does that mean for the rest of the country? Now you're back to, well, you know, it's the 1% solution. That's what Occupy Wall Street did have it right, right? The 99% are left out of that equation. So increasingly, you're bankrupting the future of the country, including its own national treasure, for national security. Well, for the, to defend a whole a, a stratum, a one, it's actually more than 1%. 1% are certainly benefiting the most. But people who benefit might be as much as 10, 15% of the society. Yeah, in terms of residual trickle down, you know, the trickle, yes, probably do. And for those who But are, it has an enormous influence shadow over the rest of the economy. Enormous. There's been a number of studies that have been done. It's what are we doing to ourselves? Because ultimately what you're, you're basically eating out the very heart of your own democracy. And so what's going to be left? Is that what we're going to be left? We're just a, you know, national, a garrison state? Well, that's effectively what's happening. And that's what, that's, uh, I saw a very interesting study of Germany in 3940. Uh, By the time they used militarization to stimulate the economy and get out of you know, deep depression and crazy inflation, there was nothing left but go to war. When your economy is essentially militarized, you, then you got to go to war. Look, the psychology here, I would just, again, I got to put on the table. If I spend this much money in terms of militarizing, remember, we've declared the entire globe a battlefield. That includes the United States of America. And if you read the National Defense Authorization Act, right, Section 1021, 1022, right, it's clear. You, we can, they can pick up, if, we, if I define you as enemy of the state, I can take you off the street if I, if I, if I want to and then incarcerate you. And I can put special exceptions on you in terms of, of how we handle it. You're basically, your due processes are severely, due process rights are severely restricted. Well, almost eliminated. Well, what type of government, governance structure is that? It's certainly not a republic or a democracy. That's a military state. That's what we're moving towards in terms of this structure. And the gated so community want, is pretty good. Well, you want to use, you're going to defend the gated communities, right, against any and all threats. So you have, to, you have to ensure there are no threats. How do you ensure there are no threats or possible threats? I gotta basically surveil society at large, both within and without the gated community, just in case. This just in case, just as an insurance policy. You just never know, and I have all this money to back it up. Remember, part of this trickle-down effect is also got, is, is infecting local, local police um, precincts, right? Where they're actually getting a lot of the largesse from the military. You just see what shows up, right? And the whole militarization of Congress. That militarization, I would argue, is, is deeply disturbing in terms of the future of democracy. Because what do you then become? And your purpose then is to ensure you exercise that. You have to exercise that power to ensure you remain in power and to send the message that you're in power. And, and the other thing that uh, I, I don't think it's new, but I think it's, it's more pervasive. In politics, and certainly in many sectors of business, psychopaths seem to rise, rise to the top. I mean, if you're, it, it, this is just made for psychopathy. If you have no conscience, you'll do whatever it takes, whatever, damn the consequences, and you're smart and know how to contain it within the law or get away with it, you can do very well. Another elephant in the room. Most most of the positions of power of this type, particularly secret power, power that's unaccountable, power, power that allows ir great irresponsibility. You know, with great power comes great responsibility, but also with great power can exercise a great irresponsibility. 
attracts those who have other purposes in mind. And that's those we tr have historically called psychopaths. And they can be extraordinarily high-functioning adults, but they get to protect themselves in power. The other checks that normally keep them in, in, in tow aren't there in these kind of positions. And so they get to, it's, it's the pathology of power. And most people that I see, most people don't seek the office, most people don't seek the presidency, most people don't seek to control and lord it over others. They just don't. But there are those who do, and I think this is, even the founding fathers, and even in taking, stripping aside the legends, the myths about the founding fathers, realize that you had to put these checks in place. And remember, they were, they were the, the radicalized elite of the day. They were the elite, they were the landowners, they also were going to be in power, but they didn't want to have a, mili a military or an oligarchy in charge. Remember, George Washington resisted becoming essentially a, a lifer of a president. He said, no, I'll go back to my estate in Northern Virginia. Would you agree with the statement that concentration of ownership also means concentration of political power? By definition, it does. So you know, you, ownership of means, ownership of the production of the means to anything. So doesn't that particularly mean particularly the national treasure? So doesn't that mean change means changing the way stuff is owned? Ultimately, yes, when it comes right down to it. Yes, changing the way things are owned. But see, that's partly if you don't have ownership of who you are, that's in terms of your own space, right? Which is sort of the value moral proposition, which those are the inalienable rights that were defined, protected, I think, are natural law rights, but in terms of the Declaration of Independence, if you don't have ownership of that, then you aren't going to have ownership of anything else. And if those things that you have traditionally assigned ownership are taken away from you, why was the Fourth Amendment so huge in terms of even the bill? Remember, it went out, it was ratified, and they said when it was in the process of being ratified, how do we protect ourselves from the government? There was no protection. That's why the first 10 amendments were added as the Bill of Rights. The Fourth Amendment is central to that because before the king could show up, an officer, right, could just show up with a writ of assistance and take anything away, including yourself. What ownership is that when anybody just come on to your, you know, your property is not yours? You can t I can take away your property. I can abscond with your property. I can con constrain your property. I can even constrain you. I can restrain you from exercising sovereign will. And I have the power to do so. There's no ownership in that. That means the state owns it. I mean, it seems to me we, we've had kind of two extremes in the last hundred and some odd years. You've, you have the kind of the socialist experiment in the Soviet Union and such, where you wound up such concentration of ownership in, a, in the party, and thus concentration of power. And the idea that uh, you know, the individual sovereignty you talk about, on paper it was there, in practice it wasn't. Uh, but then you have the American model of capitalism, where you have uh, such concentration of wealth, and you know, not even 1%, really, that if it's the half of the 1% really controls the economy and the politics. Um, on the face of it, there's this individual sovereignty, and even that's being eroded. Um, but if, if, if we're going to move forward, somehow we have to find a kind of solution to both extremes, meaning if I don't understand without public ownership how you can challenge concentrated political power. Yeah, you end up in the same place. On the other hand, you have to have a, a way to democratize that or you end up with your East German stuff. So yes, and some would argue capitalism is just another face of all this in the end, the end state of capitalism. It concentrates the wealth in the hands of a very few. So what's the difference in the end? Maybe it takes longer to get there because you have to actually involve more people to get there. Remember, what are you feeding off of? I just can't take over right away because that'd be too obvious. State-owned enterprises, right? I just, it ends up being the corporation. Well, again, depends on how it's done. I yeah. mean, if, if it's like democratized, like we've seen some experiments in Latin America where you actually can have elected managements and there's ways to democratize. I'm not saying it was ever, it was really done. But that's what that's someone where we have to growing go up forward. in Vermont, that's where I would argue, in contrast to capitalism, what you're really talking about is free enterprise. The free enterprise system is much closer to that model. 
That is much more about public ownership, but with private sovereignty protected. That's a model I grew up with. I saw that, I saw that in play every day. We even had a barter system, people trading services for the other. It was in the community, it was all local, and it was regional. But isn't it inevitable the way capitalism works that you move towards this not just concentration of ownership and not just concentration of political power, but the dominance of the finance sector, which is completely parasitical? That becomes the engine. That, that's, that, that's the oil. And so if you own those means, as we saw with what happened during this last financial crisis. And guess what? Who is truly held accountable? We bail them out. So what happens to Main Street? That's Wall Street, what happens to Main Street? I'm not sure where Main Street is anymore because it doesn't look like a street most of the time and it's been given up to other things. It's extremely concerning. I mean, I talk to people about this, and you do say, well, what I say, well, then, you know, one means you have is the power of the ballot. In our system of governance, we still have the second, you know, the second branch of government. That's the legislative. They're the ones that, quote, unquote, represent the people. I mean, it does remind me of the Frank Capra movie, right? Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Look what he got caught up in. That movie was what, you know? Almost 80 years old now. <laughs> you got destroyed. Yeah, although, you know, if you made, made you know, public appeal, public interest, you know, but there was extraordinarily powerful interest revealed. People forget about the interests that were put at stake simply because he kept, wanted to tell the truth. About a mining company, I think. Yeah, well, it was a Boy, a Boy Scout came. It was all he wanted, yeah, because they had already bought it, right? They couldn't have some Boy Scout summer camp getting in the way. Right? Because he was just a junior senator and he had already been picked, right? He didn't even know that his senior senator was, was corrupt. He was supposed to be a patsy. He was already owned. Exactly. Don't say anything. Well, I guess the conclusion of all this is people should stop, if they have any illusions left, that the elites that are controlling things now are going to solve anything for them. They won't, unless they're held accountable. And even then, they're going to hold on to the power. There's other means. I mean, you get into public ownership. This is where I appeal directly to people. Does this matter? If it matters, you're going to take action. If it matters, you'll form. If it matters, you'll align with those who do want to take back that ownership publicly. If you don't, well, then don't be surprised at what you get. I have some people that also have given up on all this. They just say, this is history. It has to run its course. We're an empire, no different than any other empire in history. We're going to end up in the dustbin of, and you're, so you're seeing the slow dissolution of that empire. So just let it run its course, Tom, and do your best to survive for the rest of your life, right? Because you already paid a high enough price, and you didn't, luckily you didn't end up in prison. You know what liberty and freedom means. I said, yeah, that's why I'm out here in public defending it. Yeah, because if you follow that type of psychology, then you really end up in Hitlerite type situations. Look, I've spoken to people from that era. It's really, it sh I, I shiver. I, sh I mean, shiver the conversations I've had with people from the 1930s. They talk about you know, the siren call, right, of authority and order, and we'll take care of you, and all these other existential threats. Don't worry about it. Everything seemed normal. As long as the trains are running on time, as long as there's food, food at the corner grocery store. Doesn't matter what else is going on. And by the way, remember what Joseph Goebel said, Minister of Propaganda. So is, this is where the history just, you know, is eyewitness here, dark, the dark eyewitness of history. You know, nothing to fear, you have nothing to hide, really. But you don't get to make that choice. The government gets to make that choice, which means they own you. Do you really want to give up that ownership? Then you got to exercise your sovereignty. You choose not to exercise your sovereignty, someone else will take it from you. All right, thanks for joining us. And thank you for joining us. This is the, concludes this round with Thomas Drake. But Thomas has agreed to come back. So sometime in the next little while, we're going to pick up the conversation. If you have questions you'd like to ask Thomas, I think he uh, will be more than agreeable to respond to them. So write in, and, and we'll pick up sometime in the next few, few weeks or so. Thanks for joining us again. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us on Reality Asserts Itself on The Real News Network.
When the U.S. goes to war, it's not just the Army and Navy that gets mobilized. How has the CIA been used as a secretive military force? Welcome to the Henry A. Wallace National Security Forum. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. The CIA began as a spy agency after World War II, when it became clear that new threats like the Soviet Union required a more robust intelligence gathering operation. But it didn't stop there. Soon the CIA was planning and executing military operations without proper congressional oversight and transparency. That continues through to today, as presidents of both parties have turned to the CIA to handle missions far away from public view. Joining me to discuss this is William Bloom, a former State Department official and author and historian. He is the author of America's Deadliest Export, Democracy, the Truth About U.S. Foreign Policy and Everything Else, as well as Killing Hope, a history of U.S. military and CIA interventions since World War II. Welcome to the program, William Bloom. Hi. Well, first, let's get into the history of the CIA and how it was that the blurring of lines between a, an intelligence gathering uh, agency and a military agency began. What uh, happened in U.S. history to sort of expand the CIA's scope beyond simply intelligence gathering? Well, following the end of the Second World War, there, there was a worldwide rising expectations movement former colonies all over uh, were revolting against their former masters, uh, Great Britain, the Netherlands, and France, and, and so on. And the, these rising expectations and these revolts uh, soon became movements for socialism or communism. And that, that rang certain bells back at CIA headquarters. And uh, the U.S. was committed, well, self-committed, to intervening in each of these places to suppress each of these attempts at revolution. Now, uh, what are the main uh, supporters of the CIA, or who are the main supporters, I should say, of the CIA? Um, is the CIA an agency that is perhaps too close to institutions in our government, such as the Pentagon, such as the White House? Does the CIA need to be a more insulated agency in order to stay truer to its original mission? Well, I'm speaking in terms of U.S. foreign policy, and that means the U.S. government. To make a fine distinction between the CIA and the Pentagon and the White House or, or the State Department, for example, misses the point. It's, it's the U.S. government which is uh, dedicated to world hegemony. They, they want to dominate the world. That's pure and simple. And so in that sense, then, is the CIA a sort of convenient tool for U.S. foreign policy? Well, it's more than just a tool. It's a major force in U.S. foreign policy, along with the, the military and the State Department. So explain how the CIA sort of works in conjunction with other national security agencies um, and whether that uh, collaboration also feeds into 